Where's the beef? Some hamburger places give you a lot less beef on a lot of bun. Where's the beef? At Wendy's, we serve a hamburger we modestly call the single. And Wendy's single has more beef than the Whopper or Big Mac. At Wendy's, you get more beef and less bun. Hey, where's the beef? As the global appetite for meat increases, people everywhere have been asking themselves, where's the beef, at an accelerating rate. But no harm done, right? What could possibly be more fit for human consumption than a nice big helping of meat? After all, animal products contain nearly everything we homo sapiens need to flourish. You see, the human body is incapable of synthesizing certain so-called essential amino acids, given the designation essential due to their importance in our diets. Our bodies need these molecules to serve as important building blocks in protein synthesis. The same phenomenon is true of many fatty acids. While essential for our survival, our bodies are unable to synthesize them, and we must therefore attain them from the food we eat. All of these essential fatty and amino acids, along with a litany of other vitamins and minerals, can be found in our friend, meat. Hi, I'm James Watkins, and I like to eat meat. To be honest, I have trouble recalling the last meal I've eaten that didn't include some form of animal product. Dairy and egg products included. If I had to guess, I would assume that my dietary situation isn't very different from those of the majority of Americans. In 2009, the US produced 208 pounds of meat per capita for domestic consumption. In English, this means that the average American consumes roughly 208 pounds of meat, excluding seafood, every year. For perspective, the average European consumes only about 60% of that amount, roughly 134 pounds annually. Yep, that's me alright. But so what? Meat isn't bad. Meat is good. Right? You see, as anyone with access to the all-knowing Google hive mind can soon discover, there are some not-so-well-hidden negative consequences to our ongoing love affair with meat. A little bit of research left me feeling thoroughly bummed, bogged down by what can only be described as a massive meat guilt. So, as any short-sighted, unprepared, impulsive individual would do, I decided to abstain from all animal products and adopt a plant-based diet for two weeks in order to see if this change is a viable alternative to the traditional animal-based Western diet. On day one, I measured some basic body metrics, weight and body fat percentage, in order to track any potential changes in these measurements over the two weeks of my dietary experiment. Over this period, I conducted some online research into the effects of meat and animal products on both personal and environmental health. I had known for some time that animal products aren't the healthiest food source on the planet, but the extent of these negative consequences truly surprised me. Let's begin with the issue of personal health. Statistics gathered by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, for the year 2010 indicate that more than one-third of American adults 35.7% are obese. Twelve states had an obesity prevalence in excess of 30% as of 2010, whereas no state had an obesity prevalence of 30% or more just 10 years prior. This astronomically high rate of obesity comes with a myriad of negative health consequences, as anyone who watches the evening news on a regular basis can surely attest. In fact, the CDC estimates that obesity-related illness was responsible for $147 billion in medical costs in the year 2008. Overeating, as well as an increasingly sedentary lifestyle, are undoubtedly the cause of this epidemic. But how have we developed such insatiable appetites? Many experts point to the artificially rich Western diet. We Americans consume incredible amounts of enriched food. Foods containing fat and carbohydrate contents that are artificially enhanced. Overconsumption of these foods, coupled with our massive appetite for animal products, greatly contributes to this epidemic. Beyond obesity, the consumption of animal products has much more dire consequences. A study published by the Harvard School of Public Health in March of 2012, involving 37,698 men followed for up to 22 years, and 83,644 women followed for up to 28 years, illustrates the long-term negative effects of meat consumption. After adjusting for other factors, the researchers concluded that a daily serving of red meat increases mortality risk by 13%, whereas a daily serving of processed meat, such as a hot dog or two strips of bacon, raises mortality risk by 20%. The researchers further estimated that 9.3% of deaths in men and 7.6% of deaths in women 
could have been prevented if all study participants consumed less than half a serving of red meat a day. However, the most compelling evidence regarding the negative effects of animal product consumption on personal health comes from the other side of the world. In 1983 and 1984, Dr. T. Colin Campbell of Cornell University, along with colleagues from Oxford University and the Chinese Academy of Preventative Medicine, conducted a sweeping nutritional survey in the Chinese countryside. Researchers collected dietary data and blood work from 6,500 participants in 65 rural Chinese counties. The results of this massive survey were then compared with mortality rates from 48 varieties of cancer and other chronic diseases as measured by a national survey conducted between 1973 and 1975. Following a thorough analysis of the data, researchers concluded that adherence to a plant-based diet that avoids animal products greatly reduces the development of chronic diseases within a population to the point where the overall effect of these diseases on the population is negligible. The China study, as it came to be known, could have vast implications for American society. Imagine an America where chronic ailments such as cancer and heart disease are nearly as prevalent as they are today. The CDC reports 599,413 deaths due to heart disease and 567,628 deaths due to cancer in 2010. These lifestyle diseases were far and away the top two killers of Americans in that year, and the problem is only getting worse. Admittedly, a small minority of cancers are due to strictly genetic factors and do not hinge on lifestyle variables, but it is important to remember that the majority of these diseases only manifest themselves when certain external factors are present. It's common knowledge that prolonged exposure to cigarette smoke or UV radiation from the sun causes many cancers, but research conducted over the last half century suggests that animal protein is responsible for turning on many genes that lead to cancer. Although not fully conclusive, the results of the China study, along with our burgeoning understanding of these biological mechanisms, strongly implies that the consumption of animal products is a direct cause of many forms of heart disease and cancer. The purported health benefits of consuming meat and animal products, namely that they provide much-needed essential nutrients in our diets, are fraudulent. A perfectly balanced diet, meeting all of our dietary needs, can be completely devoid of meat. Further, as I have touched upon, consuming animal products has well-documented adverse effects on our long-term health. But you don't care about any of that. You live fast, for the thrills. You're young. Healthy eating is for the old. The decrepit. Well, frankly, for this guy. The widespread overconsumption of meat and other animal products has consequences far beyond those relating to personal health. The large-scale factory farming that is a direct result of our insatiable appetite for animal products places an enormous burden on the environment as well. There has been a well-publicized crusade in opposition to the harm done by the vast monocultures that dominate grain production throughout much of the world. While these concerns are worthy of attention, they are not my main concern here. I'm focused on the dire environmental consequences reaped by our animal production system. First and foremost, there is the issue of waste management. The National Resources Defense Council states that over the past 30 years, the number of hog farms in the United States has decreased from roughly 650,000 to only 71,000, while the number of hogs has remained nearly constant. This statistic clearly demonstrates the degree to which animal production in this country has been concentrated over the past three decades. Flashback to a time when livestock were raised on small farms and ate grasses as ruminants evolved to consume. In this not too distant past, livestock excrement was a valuable fertilizer for cropland, and, to a certain extent, it still is today. However, the degree to which livestock production is now geographically concentrated has turned this once valued resource into an environmental menace. Whereas manure has historically fallen in pasture to fertilize the land itself, or to be collected by farmers to fertilize cropland, livestock waste on today's industrialized production facilities I hesitate to use the term farm here for fear of invoking a romantic, rustic image of rural America, is stored in large, open-air facilities referred to almost comically as lagoons. These lagoons often store millions of gallons of untreated livestock waste, which, in the event of a minute structural failure or a disruptive weather event, can leach into the surrounding water table, polluting entire ecosystems in the process. Even as the federal government begins to crack down on such high-risk practices, these ticking time bombs continue to leach unknown levels of toxins into their local environments. 
Even in a perfect world, where manure lagoons never leach toxins, they still pose an environmental risk. These vast lakes of waste emit numerous gases, the most prominent of which include hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, and nitric oxides. Both hydrogen sulfide and ammonia degrade local air quality and are toxic in sufficiently high concentrations. Nitric oxide is a known cause of acid rain, which has a number of adverse effects on ecosystems possibly hundreds of miles away. However, this is not the full extent of livestock's pollution. Waste lagoons also emit large quantities of methane and carbon dioxide, noted along with the aforementioned nitric oxides for their warming effect in Earth's atmosphere. But these emissions are only the tip of the greenhouse gas iceberg. Ruminants naturally release methane as a byproduct of digestion. The 90.8 million cattle in the US alone as of January 1st, 2012, produce a small but significant amount of this gas, which is approximately 25 times as warming as carbon dioxide. Of course, cow burps only account for a small fraction of total livestock industry greenhouse gas emissions. In the year 2007, the world produced 2.316 billion tons of grain, 27.1% of which, or 627 million tons, was fed to livestock. In the US, 80% of corn and 95% of oats produced is used to feed livestock. The greenhouse gases emitted during the production of these large amounts of grain, grown to feed cattle, pigs, and chickens, must also be counted in the total. This includes the environmental toll of widespread fertilizer use in production, which contributes vast amounts of warming gases to the atmosphere. The final known greenhouse gas emitting process is referred to as land use changes. Land use changes include, but are not limited to, irrigation and deforestation to make way for livestock. When land is disrupted and vegetation destroyed, Carbon stored there is released into the atmosphere, and the potential for future CO2 absorption is lost. An example of large-scale land use changes to make way for livestock is that of the Amazon rainforest. The majority of deforestation in the Amazon isn't due to subsistence farmers trying to eke out a living, or loggers trying to make a quick buck, as is commonly assumed to be the case. Figures produced by the Brazilian government illustrate that roughly 60% of cleared land is used for cattle pasture. A more liberal estimate from Greenpeace puts that number at 80%. The Amazon now has 214,000 square miles of cleared cattle pasture, an area larger than that of France, containing roughly 80 million head of cattle. In its 2006 report, Livestock's Long Shadow, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, or the FAO, produced a shocking figure. The report makes the claim that 18% of global greenhouse gas emissions, nearly a fifth of the total, stem directly from livestock production. This amount was greater than global emissions resulting from transportation. The FAO totaled the greenhouse gas emissions from the processes I have described to reach that conclusion. Think about that number for a moment. The total greenhouse gas emissions from livestock production exceed those due to transportation. While this global statistic cannot be accurately applied to the United States, it highlights a problem that doesn't always make the headlines. If we want to get serious about global warming, about air pollution, water pollution, deforestation, mounting losses in biodiversity, about chronic lifestyle diseases and the skyrocketing medical costs that accompany them, we need to tackle the issue of meat. Our insatiable appetite for animal products has, as I have discussed, a litany of negative consequences on our environment and ourselves. How can we address this issue? First and foremost, we need to consume less meat. In this market economy, consumers hold the power. If you reduce demand, production will decrease as well. As I mentioned earlier, as part of this project, I abstained from meat and most animal products for two weeks. This dietary alteration wasn't nearly as disrupted as I expected, and after a few days of transition, I was able to maintain a diet with no adverse effects. In fact, I noticed no measurable change in my body. However, you don't need to cut meat out of your diet completely. Try eating less, sustainably produced meat instead. Next, advocacy. Spread the word. At the moment, this issue isn't discussed publicly. That needs to change. And finally, we need to get the government on our side. Currently, the federal bureaucracy has close financial ties to agribusiness. In many cases, the regulators in charge of maintaining order in the industry are former industry executives. Further, special interest groups in service of agribusiness often influence our elected officials. Most important, further explore the issue. I've only provided a very brief overview here, and there's a lot more information out there. I suggest you see it for yourself. We have the power to change our world. What's stopping us?